um, for those who aren't just auditing the class coming and just listening in, but who are doing the readings and uh, going to do the class paper. The class paper uh, for this course is just answering the questions at the end of the beloved chapters. So just taking time, whether you type it up, whether you write it out, and just thinking through the chapters, um, whether you have a sentence answer, whether you have a paragraph answer, whatever, and you'll be able to turn that in uh, in two months by the last uh, course. And um, I'll just um, read them all over and be blessed by hearing uh, your guys' thoughts. And I'm sure you all will pass with flying colors. So. Anyways, um, the second uh, lecture tonight, I think on the second page of the notes I gave you, there's kind of the points for the different lectures of the night, and there we called this lecture, Joseph and the Robe of His Father's Love, or as the beloved book uh, calls the second chapter, the two robings of Joseph, the Father's Robe and Pharaoh's Robe, right? Two wonderful, uh, magnificent robes that Joseph is given in his life. And, you know, the story of Joseph, anybody here read Genesis 37 to 50, the story of Joseph in the Bible? The story of Joseph is a really powerful story. And uh, it is always, every time I read it, there's something new that sticks out. There's something new about uh, some new revelation I get about how Joseph's story connects to the gospel story. Because that's how we're supposed to read the Old Testament. <laughs> we're supposed to read it all in light of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus told the, four, the, the ones who own the scriptures, the ones who were given the scriptures, the Jews. He, he told the Pharisees, and he says, you, you're searching the scriptures diligently because in them you think you have eternal life. But the scriptures speak of me. And he says, in the context of all that, come to me that you might have life. I am the one who is the content of the scriptures. I'm the one through whom the scriptures come to light. And so that's what we're going to do as we look at the story of Joseph tonight. We're going to see that the story of Joseph is really just a mini picture of the gospel. We might say it's a microcosm of the gospel. And so the first verse I want to look at is Genesis 37.3 where it says, talking about Joseph's great gift from his father, who's named Israel, also Jacob. You know, there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now Joseph. Joseph is the great-grandchild of the patriarch Abraham. And it says this about Joseph. Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his other children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic, of many colors. I have a picture I just want to put up for you guys. If we can pull that up. Just shows, uh, the, the, and it's the picture you have in your packet as well. Just being clothed in, in a tunic of many colors. A, a, a tunic with the many just, just crafted in a way where every day that Joseph put it on, he could know whoever made this for me loves me a lot. Right? And every time when I'm walking through life and, and I'm clothed in this just this, this garment that's made with the best material and that's been woven and that's been artistically crafted with the most beautiful designs, I can know that the person who gave this to me really, really loves me a lot. And so that's what Joseph had through his whole life. At a young age, he was given this beautiful coat, this tunic of many colors. Um, by his father. And really, one thing I want us to understand, and this is point one, is that we should gladly embrace and be deeply aware of our father's love. We should gladly embrace and be deeply aware of our father's love. You know, Joseph had a choice every morning when he got up whether he was going to wear the robe of his father's love or whether he was just going to put on some ordinary clothes, right? And you know what Joseph did? He got up every morning and he embraced that robe of love. 
he didn't look at his worthiness, but he looked at the fact that his father considered him as beloved and as worthy. He did not shy away from the robe of his father's love. And um, in fact, we know this because one day his father asked him to go check on his other sons who were out doing some work um, in, in the fields and to bring back a report about how everything was going. Jesus actually tells parables like this, and it's really a picture of the gospel that God sent his beloved son, Jesus, to go into the field to see how his other sons were doing as ambassadors for his kingdom in the world. And what did, what did the brothers do? They didn't take very good to the beloved son coming to see how everything was going. In fact, look what it says in Genesis 37, verse 23. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. He didn't just come in any old tunic, right? He came in the tunic of many colors. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So Joseph was unafraid to wear, number one, his father's coat. Even though his brothers didn't like him wearing the coat, even though his brothers were jealous of it, they were angry about it, he, he did not shy away from it. And at that moment, when they come and, and really they go for the thing that's most precious to him, the first thing they do is they strip him of that beloved coat. And then they tear it up and they put, you know, goat's blood on it and they try to look like Joseph was murdered. And then they throw him down a pit, right? And you can just imagine Joseph at this point. It could have been a moment of great despair. And maybe to some extent it was for hours or days or weeks. We don't know exactly what was going through Joseph's mind at this moment. But regardless of his feelings at that moment, what we see is that he had interiorized God's great love and favor for him. And it would make him thrive regardless of the exterior circumstances that he was going to face. And that's the thing about our life is that our garments that we put on from God, they're not physical garments. The garments that we put on from God, they're spiritual garments. There's something that are interiorized in our heart and in our soul. I like, um, you know, the fact that when our interior life is so rooted, firm, and deep in God's great love, it doesn't really matter what's happening on the exterior because we can always respond from what's happening on the inside of us, the inside that we're so rooted in God's great love that no matter what circumstance I find myself in, I know I'm going to have God's favor there, and I'm going to thrive, and that's what Joseph would do, right? He would thrive in Potiphar's house. He would thrive in Pharaoh's prison system. Why? Because he had internalized his value. He had internalized uh, how God felt about him in his great love. And, you know, I like what uh, one author, Brennan Manning, uh, of the late 20th century, he wrote lots of books about the gospel. One thing he said about the gospel, one thing he said about his life was this. I have a quote there. He said this. He said, my deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by Jesus Christ, and I have done nothing to earn it or deserve it. My deepest awareness of myself. Now, that's a powerful place to be, is it not? And I think that's where we all need to be, that our deepest awareness of ourself is that we are deeply loved by Jesus Christ, and we have done nothing to earn it or to deserve it. Just like Joseph. You know what Joseph did to earn the robe of his father's love? Nothing. <laughs> he did absolutely nothing. His father just loved him. And God has an intricately woven, he's intricately woven a special garment of love for each and every one of us. And the question is, will we put it on? Will we wear it? Will we not be swayed by what others think? Can it become our deepest awareness of ourselves? Awareness of ourselves. You know, in the book of Isaiah, 
God gives us a beautiful picture of how he adorns us. He has covered us in the robes of righteousness and in the garments of salvation. And, you know, in fact, when um, God is quoting this through Isaiah and Isaiah 61, this is actually the chapter that Jesus preached his first public sermon from. Remember, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, you go on and you read down and really look that this is really part of the message of what Jesus does. Jesus gives us the, the garments of salvation and he gives us the robes of righteousness. That means he first clothes us with garments of shalom. He closes us with garments of wholeness, with garments of, of, of beauty. And, and, and then on top of that, he puts the robes of righteousness. He puts the robes of right standing. This is what it says in Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. That is why we rejoice, because he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me in the robes of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself in ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. That means that's how much God values us. Those are the precious robes he's given us to wear. And the thing is this, that just as the brothers stripped Joseph of his father's robe of favor and love, so that is what the devil tries to do to us concerning our garments of salvation and robes of righteousness. He wants to rip them right off of us, to throw us down a well, and to get us to despair about life. He knows that if he can convince us that we are unloved and uncared for by God, that he can wreak havoc in our soul. He can make dis us despair not only of ourselves, but he can make us be mean to those around us. And that is the strategy of the devil. In fact, that's the strategy we see how the devil deals with Jesus in his ministry. Remember the first thing that happened when Jesus was baptized and ready to begin uh, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom was that he heard a thunderous approval from heaven over the waters of the Jordan. Matthew 3.17 Suddenly, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But what happens right after that? Two verses later, Jesus, he goes into the wilderness. And what is the first strategy of attack of the devil? The first strategy of attack of a devil is to remove Jesus from the realm of belovedness. Look what the serpent slithers from the unseen realm. Matthew 4, 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, he removes the beloved son, right? If you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. So just as the devil tried to remove Jesus from the realm of the beloved son, so that's what the devil tries to do to us. He tries to remove you from the fact that you are beloved children of God, that you are beloved sons and daughters of God, that the word that was spoken over you through the cross and the resurrection, the devil wants to say that's not good for you. He wants to get you to despair. He's always trying to convince us that we are not beloved sons and daughters of God. The last thing the devil wants is for our hearts to be rooted and grounded in the immeasurable love of God because he knows that is what transforms our lives and that's what transforms the lives of those around us. So he goes for the jug juggler. He goes, he, he goes right there for, for what he can bring the most damage upon us. He wants to take off the robes of our father's love. I, w I like what Theodore Austin Sparks said. He said this one object the devil has in view is to raise a question, nay, to establish in you a question 
as to God's love and your belovedness to God. That is personally. You know, that's really true. I know in my life, the times when, um, you know, I, I'm the most down and the times when um, I'm prone to sin the most it is the time when I feel like, you know, I'm valueless. It's the times when I feel like I'm unimportant. It's the times when I don't understand God's great love for me. And that's the work of the devil. I like what the singer and songwriter Rich Mullen said. Really talking about a demonic disease. A demonic disease is really to be devoid of an awareness of the love God has for us. This is what he said. I think that of all the diseases in the world... The disease that all humankind suffers from, the disease that is most devastating to us, is not AIDS, it's not gluttony, it's not cancer, it's not any of those things. It is the disease that comes about because we live in ignorance of the wealth of the love that God has for us. That is a bad disease. Amen. So just as the brothers tried to go after the symbol of the Father's love on Joseph. So that is what the enemy tries to do to us. But thank God that we can internalize that love like Brennan Manning and saying that the deepest awareness I have of myself <laughs> is that I'm loved by God. And uh, that's, what, that's what we can do. So point number two is this is that we can overcome temptations and trials in the power of God's love. We can overcome temptations and trials in the power of God's love. You know, one of the beautiful things about the love of God is that it empowers us to serve and delivers us from the temptations of the flesh. This is what we see uh, Joseph, you know, he was 17 years old. He was a he was really just a young man, and that's the time that he was sold into slavery into Egypt. And so it says that he was a young man, that he was a handsome man, uh, and that he was a well-studied man, a well-spoken man. He stayed in the father's house while the others were in the field. He studied uh, the word of God. He, he studied, uh, he, he, was, he, was, he was a man who, who was greatly favored and had many blessings in his life. And so... He, he rises to prominence in, in Potiphar's house, right? Potiphar sees everything he does, that everything Joseph's putting his hand to is prospering. So Potiphar entrusts a lot of his house over to Joseph. He says, you know, I want you, God is, God is with you. You need to, to do this. And so Potiphar's wife looks at Joseph, and she sees everything he, that he's doing. And it says that day after day that she makes advances on Joseph, that she wants Joseph to come and sleep with her. But what happens? Day after day, Joseph, he doesn't give in to Potiphar's wife. He says, how could I do this? I do not want to sin against God. See, someone who is rooted in the immeasurable love of God, like Joseph was in the immeasurable love of his father, understand that sin gives nothing good. That sin is not ultimately pleasurable. That sin can be called out for what it is, that it is bad, that it is going from the palace to the pig pen, that it is offering us nothing good. And he could stay in the position of the love of the Father. And, um, you know, that's how we overcome temptations in life. We overcome them by the power of of God's love. And that's what Joseph was able to do. He did not give in to the advances of Potiphar's wife. Now, he was falsely accused anyways, right? And he was thrown into the prison systems of, uh, of Egypt. But by the grace of God, after spending 13 years in slavery and in the prison system, he comes before Pharaoh at the age of 30, and he interprets some dreams for Pharaoh by the grace of God, by the favor of God. And Pharaoh looks at Joseph, and he sees a man who is so favored by God because of the love of God that he's experienced, that he says, Joseph, I'm going to put you in charge. 
of all of Egypt. And Egypt being the most powerful empire in the world at that time, he's basically saying, I'm going to, you're going to be in charge. You're going to be like the second most powerful man in the world, right? This is what he's saying to Joseph. So Joseph, he comes at the age of 30, just like Jesus entered his ministry at the age of 30. And he, he, he comes before Pharaoh, and look what it says in Genesis 41, verse 42. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Now, can you imagine how fine linen garments and gold chains felt after 13 years as a slave in the prison system? I imagine that those garments and that chain felt pretty good. But I also imagine that in comparison to the robe that his father Israel had given him 13 years earlier, that that linen garment and that gold chain was just a small thing. And the truth is, the most powerful influence we have is not the coercion that we can accomplish with worldly robes, but it is the loving expressions we can accomplish with our heavenly robes. And if fine linen garments of gold chains do come our way, we can seek to use them in service of our heavenly Father, having the robe of love be the guiding light for all that we do. And so really, the great thing about life is not trying to get to the position. You know, so many people were probably scraping all of their life, beating up each other to get to that position that Joseph had. They all wanted to be second in charge, right? But it's the man from the prison system who simply internalized the love of his father, who rose that, to that position, and who from that position could use his wisdom and not abuse his positions of power. And that's what we want to do. Is we, 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 whenever we do get in positions of power, we want to use it for good and not for evil. We want to use it in loving ways. Well, the last thing I want to look at or point three, is that love triumphs over judgment. It also makes us ministers of reconciliation. Love triumphs over judgment, and it makes us ministers of reconciliation. You know, James 2.13 says this. It says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's exactly what we see in the story of Joseph. We see Joseph, one who is full of grace and truth, because he had been wrapped in his father's love from a young age, being able to approach the hard areas in his life with a massive and overwhelming amount of love and grace in a way that the world, or really anyone, simply cannot understand how he would approach his areas of hurt and pain with such grace and love. So what happens is after 22 years... 22 years, 13 years as a slave and in prison, seven as Pharaoh's right-hand man during the time of plenty, and two during the time of famine. 22 years later, Joseph's brothers come to see him for the first time again. So Joseph, he's now 39 years old. And Joseph, he does something that is unexpected for someone who had been abused and sold by those standing before him. You know what he does well, the first time he sees his brothers? He, he begins to show them favor after favor after favor. He sends them with bag loads of food home and all the money they came with back in their bags. You know what else he does? He invites them all to a great big feast. And he says, you know, killed the, fa the fatted animals for this feast. He gives them a feast in the time of a great world famine. And he's not even revealing who he is at this point to them. He's just continuing to show them favor. And then finally, after he does all these favorable deeds, he decides to reveal himself. And look what it says when he reveals himself in Genesis 45, verse 3. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. 
you know the immediate response to the revelation of Joseph's identity was what? It was fear. And rightfully so, right? For they had used and abused him. They were probably terrified that he would return insult for insult. But something dramatically different happens. Joseph can create an atmosphere of reconciliation. And he can create an atmosphere of reconciliation. Why? Because he had internalized the robes of his father's love. Look what happens in Genesis 45, verse 14. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers, even, you know, the ones who were wanting to kill him. And he wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. That's what those grounded and rooted in God's love can do. They can be ministers of reconciliation. You know, some people, even after 22 years, can have pain points where they are still so full of hatred towards somebody, and it can really mess with them their entire, their entire life. And, you know, that's not a good position to be. And thank God we don't have to be like that, but we can be like Joseph. We can be tender-hearted people. We can understand that mercy triumphs over judgment. I like what one fifth century commentator said, Caesar of Arles. He said this. He said, he, Joseph, washed away the hate of his brothers by the tears of his love. Isn't that good news? And we'll finish up here real quick. You know what Joseph does after that is he gives them all a bunch of money. He gives them all garments. He loads them up with food. He gives them a bunch of uh, carts to bring back all of their family members, like Egyptian limousines, right? And he says, I'm going to take you to the best places in Egypt. I'm going to give you the best land of Goshen. You know, <laughs> you're going to have the best cars, the best cribs, right? You are going to have it made here in Egypt. And that's exactly what he does. But, you know, even in all that time, and his father comes and spends 17 more years with Joseph, he had 17 years with Joseph in his early life. Then he had 22 years of heartbreak. Then he had 17 years with Joseph at the end of his life. But after his, his daddy died, after Israel died, after Jacob died, the brothers were fearful again. Because they thought, maybe Joseph only showed us favor because our father was alive. And so again, their hearts never had really sunk deep into the love of their brother. They were still terrified. They thought, maybe the good news isn't as good as I thought it was. Maybe it's like sort of good, but then if we're not that good, maybe it's kind of bad news. So look what happens. Genesis 50, verse 15. When, bro when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we um, did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He, he can't believe their mentality, right? Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Right? They're, they're really trying. They just don't want to be killed by their brother. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Just like all of God's messengers do in the New Testament when the angels show up. What do they first always do? Don't be afraid. For I, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, right, vengeance is God's. That's one of the most quoted scriptures in, in the Bible. Vengeance is God's. It's not ours. We repay evil with kindness, with goodness, Paul says. Now look what he goes on to say. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. He has a whole different worldview. In order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You know, those rooted and grounded in the robe of their father's love can always comfort those around them. They can always speak kindly to those around them. And really, when we see this picture of Joseph, guess what? You know, Joseph ain't no Jesus. 
we have someone even better than Joseph. And the compassion and the grace that Joseph showed to his brothers is just a small drop in the bucket next to the compassion and grace that Jesus will show his brothers and sisters. That's why Jesus is always telling us to not be afraid. I just want to end with this, point four. Above all, be clothed in love. The coat of many colors is a coat of love. Colossians 3.14, above all, clothe yourself in love. When we are clothed in love, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. We can understand that, like was talked about in lecture one, that the Father has got the best robe for us. He said, run and go get the best robe. And we have that robe, and it is a robe of love. And we don't ever have to take it off. And that we can respond out of that robe of love, even in our deepest wounds like Joseph did. We can respond with grace, compassion, reconciliation. And that brings healing. And that's like Jesus. Amen? Aren't you glad for the robe of your Father's love? Awesome. I want to invite Janan, why don't you come up here now? And uh, we'll get ready for the last lecture. All right, that was great. Let's give Pastor Josh a hand. All right, thank you. All right, so we're going to take our last three-minute break.